First of all, this morning, it's always great for me to have my mom with me, and she is here this morning. She couldn't pass up a good Thanksgiving meal, so it's good to have her with us. By even the most conservative observance, our world is spinning out of control. But this morning, the question I want us to ask and answer is, is it really? I believe Jesus has a thing or two to say about that. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Luke chapter 21. And we'll try to figure out exactly what he had to say to us about that. In Luke 21, Jesus gives a prophetic word about the coming destruction of Jerusalem, which took place in A.D. 70. One commentator has said that prophetic words in Scripture often have a dual application. The word was given concerning a judgment that was at hand, but also connected to an event that might be generations in coming. But one event mirrored the other. The way of reading history sees events as linked or mirroring one another. Jesus' words in Luke chapter 21 link together two such events. The destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD and the events of the end signaling his return to earth. Because these events are patterned after one another and mirror one another, then many of Jesus' words in this section applies to both. Luke clearly sees how the destruction in 70 AD is distinct, but it's also related to the end. The two events should not be confused. But Jerusalem's destruction, when it comes, will guarantee, as well as picture the end, since one mirrors the other. Both are a part of God's plan as events move toward the end. In fact, if one were to ask why Jerusalem was being judged, Luke had given many reasons in his book as to why. It was filled with hypocrisy. It had oppressed the poor. It had rejected the Messiah. It had missed his day of visitation. Most importantly, it had rejected the gospel. And it had slain God's son. The same can be said of our day in so many quarters. The end is closer today than it was yesterday. Many of you observing the events of this week might say it's a whole lot closer than it was this time last week. But the call is to remain steadfast because God is in control. Life is not about brick and mortar. In verse 5 of Luke 21 we read these words. Some were speaking of the temple, and while they were, about how it was adorned and with noble stones and offerings, Jesus said, As for all these things that you see, the days will come when there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And they said, Teacher, when will these things be, and what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? The structures of earthly empires are often impressive. And they give the sense that they and what they represent will last forever. But if you visit the ruins of Babylon or even the Aztecs and Rome and Greece, one imagines that the people that were living in the day when those buildings were beautiful and stately, 
they assumed that the glory of those buildings would endure forever. Humanity teams seems to suffer from delusions of immortality. The rebuilt temple of Herod created that kind of impression. When the disciples praised that temple to Jesus here in verse 5, the temple was in the midst of an 83-year building program. Talk about your building programs. <laughs> Ours was two months last summer. They were in the midst of an 83-year building program. It started around 20 B.C. and it continued until around 63 or 64 A.D. Just a few years before Jerusalem's fall in A.D. 70. If we assume that Jesus was crucified in and around the year 33, then the program was over 50 years old at the, at the time that the disciples marveled at it. The temple made a deep impression on all who visited. Some of its stones were 12 to 60 feet long, seven and a half feet high and nine feet in width. The temple loomed over the city like a snow-clad mountain, someone wrote. Not only was the building impressive, but it was decorated with gifts from other countries and had elegantly adorned doors and gates of fine craftsmanship. No wonder the disciples felt national pride as they viewed this awesome temple. Surely something so magnificent and God-honoring, something that had taken so long to build, would last a very long time. God's presence finally had a home. So Jesus' response to them in verse 6 must have come like a knife to the heart. As for what you see, these things that you look at, the beauty of this place, the days will come when there will not be one stone left upon another that will not be thrown down. It's hard for us to appreciate the effect on Jewish ears of what Jesus predicts here. The message of Jesus to those in the first century is the same as it is to those of us in the 21st century. The truths of life lie in the spiritual realm, not in the material realm. All of this is passing away. What matters are the issues of the heart and our relationship with the God who made us. Then very quickly Jesus turns to a warning for them and I believe for us today. He said, see to it that you are not led astray. Many will come in my name saying, I am he. And the time is at hand. Do not go after them. And when you hear of wars and tumults, do not be terrified. For these things must first take place, but the end will not be at once. So Jesus first warns about events that are not yet the end. Messianic pretenders abound. So the disciples must not be deceived. We must not be deceived. Do not follow them. The loudest voices as the end draws near will be those that will want to lead us away from what really matters. We see it in the violence in our world today. We see it in the violent protest in our own country. We see it in the Middle East and in Europe. I saw a video of a man who did nothing more than come out of a voting place 
having voted for Donald Trump being jerked out of his car and beaten on the street. I'm going to tell you something. God is at work using broken vessels to lead us. In the midst of it all, the church must have a voice. In fact, as the time of the end draws nearer, our voice must become louder. Our voice must be true and genuine the voice of God and for God. Never in our history has St. Francis's prayer for peace been more timely. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope, where there is darkness, light, where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, for it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Jesus also tells us that following him can be costly. Then he said to them, nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes and famines and pestilences and terrors and great signs from heaven. But before all of this, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. Folks, I don't know what's going to happen in America before the end. I don't know. But I will say this, I don't believe that persecution of Christians is out of the realm of possibility. Social chaos civil turmoil, wars, and other events will precede the end. We should not be surprised when the world is in chaos. There is no need for alarm. The Word of God says these things must take place. Sin will be with us until Christ returns. Pain and persecution in the world should never surprise us. Despite the chaos, God's plan is moving on. The end will not come right away. Jesus is preparing his disciples for a time that is to come. And then Jesus tells his first century disciples and his 21st century disciples how to respond when things are spinning out of control. We need to hear this word from the Lord this morning. I said that following Jesus sometimes is costly. But the message of the gospel is that following Jesus is always worth the cost. I want to give you a pastoral word this morning. Be cautious about what you say about the election just passed. In our country this morning, there are those who think that the election was a wonderful thing. On the other hand, there are those, millions of those, who are afraid and confused and hurting. Among those who are afraid and confused and hurting this morning, are many who are our brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. Our job as the church of Jesus Christ is to be faithful to the one who is in charge. That means that political division cannot divide the church. We must be the hands and the feet 
to those who were afraid, to those who were confused, and to those who were hurting. As you interact with friends and acquaintances and family and co-workers about this election, regardless of which side of the fence you find yourself, please be the hands and feet of Jesus in the life of everyone that God places in your path. Listen carefully to the words of Jesus in verse 13. This will be your opportunity to bear witness. He says, settle it therefore in your minds not to meditate beforehand on how to answer. Jesus says, be ready. Be prepared for whatever might come your way. Think about it now. So that when you are in that situation, you will know how to respond. This will be your opportunity to bear witness. You will be hated by all for my name's sake. It's easy sometimes to follow Jesus when there's no persecution. If persecution comes, it will get much more difficult for us to follow him. He says there will come a day when the very fact that you call yourself a Christian will bring hatred by others to you. Don't believe that can't happen. I mean, we've seen it this week just in the political realm. But it will come to the church as well. But this is what Jesus says. Not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your lives. Doesn't mean that we won't be hurt. Doesn't mean that we won't lose our lives. But what it does mean that if we lose our lives, then God has a plan for all of eternity for all of us. By your endurance, you will gain your lives. Paul said this in this morning's epistle reading in 2 Thessalonians. Brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. Do not grow weary in doing good. On Thursday night, TNT, which is the television station for the NBA, gave each of their NBA studio hosts airtime about two minutes each to share their feelings about what happened in the election. Charles Barkley said, while he didn't vote for Donald Trump, we have to give him a chance. Kenny Smith decried Trump's divisive campaign rhetoric, saying he crossed a moral line. And Shaquille O'Neal mostly agreed with Charles Barkley. But the most thoughtful remarks came from the host, Ernie Johnson, Jr. Ernie Johnson, Jr. lives in Atlanta as a, as a committed Christian. He shared, often on the verge of tears, as he described his conflicted emotions following Tuesday's vote. He said, when this campaign started, I felt like I'd been dealt a bad hand had these couple of choices. And there were trust issues with Hillary Clinton that I couldn't get past. And there was inflammatory rhetoric from Donald Trump, which to me was incomprehensible and indefensible. I couldn't vote for either one, he said. For the first time in going to the polls for 42 years, I hit the right end button and voted for John Kasich. And I left knowing that John Kasich wasn't going to win. But I left with a clear conscience because I hadn't settled. Number two, he said, I'm hopeful. I watched the video today on CNN and was going on, uh, the, well, what was going on at the White House with Donald Trump and President Obama. I was hopeful. 
I was encouraged that there will be a difference between President Trump and campaigning Trump. And I'm with these guys. We have to give him a chance. He said, but here's the deal. I just hope that he's all in in fixing the wounds in this country and the divides that separate this country. And I want to be a part of that too. And for me to be a part of it, I have to look in the mirror and I have to say, how am I going to be a better man? How am I going to be a better neighbor? How am I going to be a better citizen? How am I going to be a better American? How can I be a fountain and not a drain? And number three, he said, I know you're not supposed to talk about politics and religion, but we're already talking about politics, so I'm going to go the R direction too. I never know from one election to the next who's going to be in the Oval Office, but I always know who's on the throne. And I'm on this earth because God created me, and that's who I answer to. I'm a Christian. I follow a guy named Jesus. You might have heard of him. And the greatest commandment he gave me was to love others. And the scripture tells us to pray for our leaders. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray for Donald Trump. I'm going to pray for all those people right now who feel like they're on the outside looking in. Who are afraid at this point. I'll pray for them too. In short, he said, I'm praying for America. And I'm praying that one day we're going to look back and we're going to say, you know what? That Donald Trump presidency, that was all right. He said, but right now, I'm praying. I'm praying. Be careful. The election is over. It is now time for the Church of Jesus Christ to rise up. The loudest voice in our culture needs to be our voice. Because we have the voice that makes a difference in the world in which we live. May the Church of Jesus Christ rise up in our day with a loud voice in defense of those who have no voice proclaiming the truth that Jesus Christ Jesus Christ Jesus Christ is the way the truth and the life in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.